If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Genesis chapter 48 this morning. Genesis 48. We've seen here to pick up where we left off. Jacob and his family have come down to Egypt, and they're going to be there for several generations. They're going to be there for over 400 years, and now they've been there for close to, we don't know exactly the amount of time here, but Jacob is 130 when they get here, and in this chapter, he's maybe right on death's doorstep, at least he thinks he is. And so they've maybe been, he, they, he's there for 17 years before he dies, so maybe this is in that last year or so. So they've been there now for 17 years in the land of Goshen, in the, in the land of blessing. God has spared their lives. They didn't die in the famine, and not only did they just survive, they're thriving And it says that they went there and they multiplied exceedingly. This was the greatest time of, uh, as far as numbers, multiplication that Israel ever saw. It was not in the promised land. It was in Egypt that they multiplied and their numbers uh, grew like never any other time. So let's pick it up here. Uh, Jacob is getting old and it says that he gets sick. And that's the... uh, kind of the impetus that gets this chapter rolling. So Genesis 48 and verse 1, it says this. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. This, uh, very quickly, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this this morning, but this is a quick reminder to us of the mortality, the frailty of Jacob. Jacob was just like any one of us. It's easy to look at the the people in the Bible in the Old Testament or New Testament, the people in the Bible that they were God's men. They were men and women of God. And, you know, they just kind of floated around. They didn't actually have to walk like we did. And uh, things were just done for them. They never got sick and so forth. Uh, And so it's a a good thing that God... uh, reminds us here. God could have skipped over this, and God could have just sugarcoated. By the way, God puts all of the faults and warts and failures of of the great men and women of the Bible in there just to let us know that we never put them on a pedestal, and that's uh, encouraging to us when we fall that, you know, we're just like them. And so here's a reminder that that, uh, not only of the mortality of Jacob as a human, but as a believer and as a great man of God, He gets sick, and uh, just as an aside this morning, uh, we need to be reminded that it's a false teaching that if you are in the center of God's will, walking with God and believing in God, that all of your problems are going to be taken care of and you'll never get sick, and if somebody does get sick, then that's an indication that they have strayed from the faith and or that they don't have the faith to believe enough so that they can be healed. And there are people who, there are churches that do this and, you know, somebody's sick and they come and they ask for prayer and they pray for him. The guy doesn't get well. And then the pastor blames it on the guy. Well, sorry, you know, your faith must not have been strong. So now just tuck your tail between your legs and go home and just lament the fact that you're a weak, faithless Christian. And they're discouraged. They don't know what to think. And that's not the teaching of the Bible. Uh, the Bible shows that everyone died. By the way, everyone dies, right? So if you died, you didn't have victory over all sickness. Um, Uh, But I want to just real fast read a couple of verses. 2 Kings 13 verse 14 says, Elisha was a great man of God. He did miracles. Elisha did the most miracles of anyone in the Old Testament. Twice as many as Elijah. And that's not to say that he was awesome, but God was awesome. Uh, but, But he was a great man of God. And it says, now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Uh, It doesn't say what the sickness was, but uh, the way Elijah went up in a whirlwind, in in a chariot of fire to heaven. But Elisha, he got sick and he died. And that doesn't mean that he wasn't a great man of God. Uh, Great men and women of God get sick. In 1 Timothy 5, 23, uh, 23, 23, I was looking at the word water, 20, water 23. Uh, and, and Paul tells Timothy, drink no longer water but wine for thy stomach's sake and for thine often infirmities. Timothy got sick a lot, it says. And that doesn't mean that he just struggled in his faith, but he was just, and by the way, Paul healed people in his life, didn't he? There were times when uh, even uh, he sent napkins uh, and uh, God 
bless those napkins doesn't mean necessarily that we're supposed to try this today, but some people do. But Paul would send uh, and a cloth that he had touched, touched someone, and they were healed. Paul healed people. How come Paul just didn't heal Timothy? Huh. Well, it's not, a, and Paul himself got sick or had that thorn in the flesh, and he prayed that God would take it away, and God didn't take it away. And that doesn't mean that Paul was uh, a weak faith Christian. Uh, so anyway, just want to, there there, there's times that it's God's will to heal. It's not always God's will. And be very careful that you don't walk up to somebody and say, I know why you're sick. I know it. I know why you just stubbed your toe because you're wicked. So tell me what you've done like Job's friends. Anyway, just a reminder here uh, of Jacob's, uh, his sickness is a reminder of his mortality, not just as a human, but as a great man of God. He was able to, to get sick and die um, and so let's go on, number two. So first of all, I just want to look at that in verse one, Jacob's sickness. Number two, I want to start looking at the blessing, Jacob's blessing that he gives to, jo- to uh, Joseph. And let's read uh, down through verse six. It says, And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee, and Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. It's really interesting how, why God uh, shifts and uses the other name. By the way, Israel is Jacob. It's his, his new name. It's interesting that it says, one told Jacob, your son is coming, and Israel strengthened himself. And so it doesn't always mean, sometimes people say, oh, whenever it's Jacob, it means he's wayward in his life. And whenever it's Israel, it's because God is blessing him and he's walking with God. It was just his other name, so they use them interchangeably. Uh, look at verse 3. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine." And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. What Jacob is saying here to Joseph is that the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob, every bit of that, you, just because we were there and you came over to Egypt and now you have two sons, you know, you've married uh, the daughter of a priest here and you had a couple of sons and he's probably wondering, What about my sons? What's going to happen in their future? He's telling them that he's blessing him by saying, you're not going to be left out of that covenant. They will be full heirs. Uh, And in fact, he, he elevates them and says that those two, which are my grandsons, today I'm making them my sons. I'm elevating them one notch, so to speak. And just like, by the way, he says, just like uh, Reuben and Simeon, uh, he could have picked two better ones. <laughs> Reuben and Simeon were kind of losers, but anyway. Uh, but, but just the way that they are, are real full sons, I'm not going to look at your sons as grandsons. I'm not going to look at them as half Egyptian. Uh, they were half Egyptian. I'm not going to look at them as, as lesser at all. They are full sons, and so he's kidnapping. I mean, he's, uh, he's adopting them uh, in this day and kind of bringing them into the family, and we'll come back to that uh, in just a little while. As an aside, look at uh, the third thing I'm going to look at very quickly in verse 7 is Jacob's wife that he mentions. It says, And as for me, when I came from Paden, Rachel died by me, in the land of Canaan. And by the way, from the other passages, we know that this was when she was giving birth to Benjamin. So a, a bittersweet moment. Uh, I've never had, I've heard of this type of thing, obviously, but it's, it's more rare in today's society with medical advancements. But uh, I've heard of this, and it's uh, what greater joy than to have the birth of a child, and, but what greater sorrow than the death of a spouse. And they happen on the same day in the same moment. Uh, and so, uh, so Rachel dies giving birth, and it says that Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath, and I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same is Bethlehem. So they're traveling along, they're, Jacob was a sojourner, he lived in tents, and as they're traveling, Benjamin's born, she dies there, and he buries her there, which just happened to be the same place that's called Bethlehem nowadays. And so uh, Bethlehem is known for being where Jesus was born and also where Rachel dies. And so he buries her in Bethlehem. Why is it significant that he buries her in Bethlehem? 
Hold your finger and look at uh, chapter 49. We'll get here. We'll get there in the next couple of weeks, but look at chapter 49 and verse 29. <coughs> Genesis 49, 29, it says, And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephraim the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephraim the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. And you could put in there, my wife. So uh, it was important to Jacob that when, when I die, don't bury me here in Canaan. Uh, don't bury me here in Egypt. And don't bury me just anywhere in Canaan. Bury me in the place where our family is buried. Abraham, his wife. Isaac, his wife. And me and my wife. He didn't make it a point to bury Rachel in that place, but he made a point to go and bury Leah in that place. And I don't think it was just because that's where he, uh, I don't think that he was just passing by and, you know, I just went to visit the grave uh, of my father and my grandfather and she died right there, so I decided to bury her right there. That's not how it happened. Wherever he was, he took a special trip to bury Leah there, but he did not take a special trip to bury Rachel there, but he loved Rachel more. You would have thought that if he had to pick between the two, he would have said, Leah, I never liked her. She doesn't get a good burial, but Rachel, she gets buried in the burying place of honor. Why does Jacob choose Leah, who he married first, to be buried there, and Rachel just to be buried wherever she died? I think that he is acknowledging that she was the one. Even though he got tricked into marrying her, even though he didn't want to at the time, he married her first. And I think that he's acknowledging that she is the wife. How far, how far do we take it? Is he acknowledging that he should not have married Rachel? I don't know. Is he acknowledging that he shouldn't have taken the other two concubines as wives? Uh, but, but I think he recognizes that, that Leah was the wife that should have been. You know, polygamy in the Bible happened a lot, but it was never condoned by God. It was, it was never God's design for, for a man to have multiple wives. It says in the book of Genesis chapter, right from the beginning, from the creation. It says, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his, not wives, but his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So God, and that's in Old Testament, New Testament, it reiterates that truth. That God looks at, it's a beautiful picture. God looks at two people when they're married as now one person. And then Jesus furthered that and he says, um, now they are no more twain, but one flesh. They are no more two people. They were two and then they got married. Now they're one. And now they are no more two people, but one flesh. And then he says, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And so that would speak to both Polygamy, it would also speak to divorce and remarriage as not God's in initial design, it's not God's intent for, for men and women. Uh, and so, uh, and also the Bible is clear that the death of the spouse is the only thing in God's sight that releases that uh, ball and chain. I mean, that releases, I was just kidding there. Uh, it's the only thing that releases God's view of the one flesh. By the way, we're not... Uh, Mormons believe that they're married for all of eternity. Uh, you're not married for all of eternity, so <laughs> don't have to worry. About, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just joking around this morning. Um, but in marriage, uh, in eternity, you're married to Jesus. Okay, We're the bride of Christ. Here, we are married to each other, and, and only death separates that. Let's hold your finger here and look at a couple of verses very quickly. Look at Romans chapter 7, verse 2. And then we'll also look at um, a verse in Malachi 2 and 1 Corinthians 7. Maybe for the sake of time, those I'll just read. But look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 2. This is put here to teach a broader truth that we'll come back to in just a minute but about Jesus and the church. But uh, to illustrate that truth, to teach that truth, God hearkens back to marriage. So look at Romans 7 and verse 2. It says, For the woman which hath an husband 
is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And so here God, you know, he says that he doesn't want people to get divorced, that death is what divides it. He says in Malachi chapter 2 that he hates divorce, and he he says that divorce is dealing treacherously with your wife, with your spouse. It says, I'll just read it real fast, Malachi 2.16, For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away or divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. So it says that putting someone away, divorcing them, is dealing treacherously toward them and with them. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So by the way, let's look at this one real fast. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. So, and I read this just to say, okay, so what if, what if that it does happen? And it does happen in our society and even in our Christian homes and families. Uh, it's not God's design and desire for divorce. But what if somebody does uh, get divorced? Now what do they do? Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 answers that question from God's perspective. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10, it says, And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord... Let not the wife depart from her husband. So don't get divorced. But then what if she does? But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. Uh, And so it says that the two options that are now on the table when someone gets divorced are to remain single or to reconcile. And in our society, by the way, I have never Heard, if somebody calls into a show, even if they call into a Christian radio station or something, I don't think I've ever heard someone say, you know, I got divorced, what do I do now? Uh, usually it's like, oh, well, you got divorced. I mean, that's, whew, that bridge is burned. That's never going back. They never say, you know what, you can reconcile. That's God's greatest, and that's be God's greatest desire to reconcile. And I've heard of that before. Uh, I, I've, I know of a uh, someone that was divorced and then they got you know, remarried, they reconciled and remarried their spouse. But that is never an option that our society pushes. But that, those are the one of the two options. Uh, and by the way, our society will also not say, I think you should just remain single. But God says those are the two options. Society wants to remarry, but God says the only way to remarry is if the husband dies. And he's not suggesting murder, okay, uh, to get there. That God, there are other laws in the Bible about that. But anyway, um, so why, by the way, why is this so important to God? Why does he spend time mentioning this? Here's the reason that it's so important to God is because marriage, our marriages, and particularly as Christian marriages, we are designed to demonstrate a truth to the world. And the parallel, and it talks about it in first, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, that as Christ loved the church, husbands are to love their wives. There's a great parallel. Our marriages are to mirror and mimic the relationship between Jesus and the church. What happens between Jesus and the church, by the way? The church, which is uh, you are by yourself, you are the church. You're one, of the, uh, you're, you're one of the church. You're one of the body of Christ. And the relationship between you and God, you and Jesus is like this, and it's the same for me. We blow it, and then he forgives us. And he reconciles. And he will never cast us off. He says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. There's no asterisk. And then you have to look down in the margin. Oh, it says I will never leave thee and forsake thee unless you do blah, 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 such and such. There's no caveat. Jesus will never leave you. You are married to him. You are the bride of Christ, and that's supposed to be mirrored in our marriages. God wants us to be willing to forgive and reconcile anything. And the book of Hosea is a great example. God says, to, by the way, it's tough to be a prophet of God. Here's what God, he comes to Hosea one day and says, I want you to go marry somebody, and her name is going to be Gomer. And imagine what she looks like if her name is Gomer. Anyway, 
uh, I know you're picturing Gomer Pyle from uh, Andy Griffiths. Anyway, uh, he says, I want you to marry someone and know in advance that she's going to leave you. She's going to walk away from you and she's going to commit adultery with many lovers. But I want you to marry her anyway. And then when she does that, I want you to go and find her. And, and it says that she was disgraced. She was on an auction block somewhere to be sold as a slave. He says, I want you to go and find her and buy her back and reconcile with her. And then Hosea goes to his wife and he says, uh, basically to paraphrase it, he says, uh, I don't want you to be unfaithful to me anymore. I want you to stay with me. I want you to be with me. And so will I be to thee. And it's a great picture of God's love for his people. And, and so God and Israel is pictured there. And Jesus and the church is pictured in marriage. And when we go out and, you know, if there's polygamy, which is not as much in our, anyone married to more than one person right now? Um, but anyway, it's not as frequent. But with divorce and remarriage, here's one of the things that happens is that we ruin that picture of Jesus and the church and eternal reconciliation and eternal love that will never cast you off. I'll never forsake you and go find somebody else. Uh, and we ruin that picture in front of the world when we do that. Uh, and if the world sees that there's to be a parallel between marriage and Jesus and the church, they might start to think, I wonder if I were to get saved, if I could lose my salvation. Will God just cast me off and get a new one? Um, and so we carry the, the weight, the responsibility of that banner. We're to represent the church and salvation to the world. Uh, and so that's why it's such an important thing in God's eyes. Uh, by the way, it's when, when Jesus said that, that, uh, you know, that's it. If, if, uh, if you're married, you're married. Let not God put asunder. When he said that to the disciples, they were so shocked. Apparently, this is not the way they lived in Israel at the time. They were so shocked that he said that, that they said, if that's the case, then it's not good to be married. If once you're in, you're in, and that's that, then it be- I've... I needed that out clause, you know. What about my prenups? I, I need, uh, she's not going to take half my stuff, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, it, when they heard that, they said it'd be better to not, and it shows that they realized what he was saying, that marriage is for keeps. Uh, here's one of the things that it speaks to us, is that marriage is a very sober thing. If you're single here, marriage is a very serious thing. It's not a flippant thing. You don't just meet somebody and, hey, I think we'll first, I think let's just play married. Let's just live together and act like we're married. Marriage is, you know, it's a covenant that we save ourselves for. But then you don't just flippantly jump in and jump out of marriage. It is very serious. It's lifelong. Uh, and so it matters who you get married to. We should pray about it a lot. You should ask yourself, does God want me to marry this person? You should the criterion is more than what does he or she look like, okay? If that's the only criterion, you are in for, uh, first of all, a rude awakening when you get married and she takes off her makeup for the first time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, you know, as, as time goes on, but there is so much more. There is character. Are you married to somebody that just looks good? Or, or are you thinking about marry, marrying someone that just looks good? Or are you thinking about marrying somebody that is committed to God's plan and will forgive you when you mess up and will stick it out through thick and thin? Uh, one of the things they say in most marriage vows is, for better or worse. And everybody goes through the times of worse. And when you say for better or worse, you have this in your mind, and then it turns out that the worse could be that. You're like, ah, oh, this is not what I signed up for. Yes, it is. We signed up for, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse. And so it's a very sobering thing whenever we think about, we get to that place in our lives where um, we're thinking about getting married. It's very serious. You don't, you don't just decide in a, on a whim to get married. And then I want to finish with this really fast, that uh, we say this before, that what happens if there is divorce and remarriage? God's plan is not to say, oh, I messed up. Let me, okay, let me divorce number two and go back to number one, or let me divorce number three, but then do I go back to number two or number one? You know, that's not God's plan. If you're divorced and remarried, then God's plan is just stay married to who you're married to and treat that person like, um, G- like Jesus treats the church. Forgiveness, reconciliation, decide there's no way. We're not going to entertain the, the D word in our marriage. We're not even going to talk about divorce. It's not going to be something that's on the table that we threaten with, that we just throw around because I'm going to picture uh, Jesus and the church to my spouse, not just to the world, but to my spouse. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to live forgiveness and love. Um, and God can, you know, if somebody has made that mistake. God can give forgiveness and make beauty out of ashes. But he wants us to stay married to our current spouse no matter uh, who they are, no matter what number they are, you know, or 
Um, God, you know, views you as one flesh. So uh, Jacob mentions his wife in a way that I think he, he recognizes that God saw Leah as my wife. And so he has her buried in that place. Let's go on. Uh, look back in uh, Genesis 48 and verse 8. The rest of this chapter talks about Jacob's birthright prophecy, we'll call it this morning. So let's read verses 8 through 10. Genesis 48, verse 8, it says, And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? By the way, that's kind of strange. <clears throat> He's been there for 17 years. And Joseph brings his two sons and says, Who are these guys? I've never seen these guys before. What's he, what? But look at the next couple of verses. And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. I think verse 10 explains verse 8. The reason that he said, Who are these two guys? was just that he couldn't see them. He was bl just about as blind as a bat. As By the way, as his father was. Remember the day that he deceived his father? This is Jacob. He's the one who deceived his blind father. And oh, so he seems to have inherited. I'm not saying that he went blind because he deceived his blind father. But he you know, inherited the genes uh, of his father. The, he didn't have very good eyes. Remember Isaac lived blind for the last 50 years of his life. 50 years blindness. Uh, and so Jacob here is blind basically, or at least blind enough that he can't make out the, the faces. Uh, it's, it's not that he had dementia, you know. Dad, you've met him every day for the last 17 years, you know, and here it is again. Who are these people? Uh, I saw a t-shirt just yesterday that said, warning, insufficient memory. So, you know, you get to that place in your lives. I don't think that's what's happening with, with uh, Jacob here. I think that he just couldn't see. Um, so let's go on. Look at verse 11. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath showed me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. So uh, he's about to, this is, uh, some, what's this going on that he brings them out? They're probably 20 years old or so now. Um, what are they doing between Joseph's knees here? You know, maybe kind of a, a ceremonial type of thing where, uh, and by the way, the Hebrew literally means near his knees. So Jake, he was sitting maybe on his throne or his seat, and they were standing maybe on his right hand or on his left. And so he brings them and, and, and pushes them toward uh, Jacob. And then it says that Joseph bowed himself with his face to the earth. Joseph. So here's what some people see on this day. Some people see the second in command of Egypt bowing down before this feeble, old, blind man and paying him an honor that he doesn't really deserve. Some people would say that Joseph has outgrown Jacob. You know, he's a, who's greater at this moment in the earth? Is Joseph greater or is Jacob greater? Uh, some people say, you know, he's just deferring here. He's just being nice and, you know, just showing respect to the elderly. But I, uh, while, while some would see someone great bowing down to this feeble old blind man, I think what the Bible shows us here is a son bowing down before his father. And, and what did we say about Jacob here? We could say, well, he's not just any father. He is a great, he's a godly man. He's one of the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, I mean, as that position, he bows before him. I don't think it mattered on this day if his dad was falling down drunk on this day. I don't think it matters if he was wicked, if he had turned out to be a deadbeat, a loser of a guy. I think that Joseph is honoring his father. And as children, no one ever outgrows their parents from that perspective. We're com commanded in Exodus chapter 20, and then repeated in the New Testament as well, that children are to honor their father and their mother. And it doesn't say while you're in the house. It doesn't say while you're under the age of 18 or while you're under the age of 30. There's no age that that respect is thrown out the window, that that honor. And I think that's just what's happening on this day, is that Joseph 
honors his father and realizes his place. By the way, they, there's kind of a mutual bowing. Remember one of the, the prophecies that God gave Joseph was that the sun, moon, and eleven stars would bow to him. His father, so to speak, bowed to him as in he needed him to save his life. And, he, and there was that ob- obeisance and reverence. But no matter what happened in his life as far as his position, he never outgrew the command of God. He never outgrew the principle of God to honor parents. By the way, there may be a time, you know, people leave the house or they get married, and there may be a transfer of authority. You may not be under the authority of your parents in the same way to where they, you know, you have to obey them the same way. For instance, uh, if, a, if a grandfather says to a father, this is what I want you to do with your children. Take them out of that and put them in that. You know, that father is not beholden to obey the grandfather. He is now responsible for how he raises his own children, and there's a transfer of that authority. But that doesn't mean just because the the authority is shifted, that doesn't mean that honor has shifted. We are always commanded to honor. We're never to dishonor. Sometimes that can mean obeying. It means to give them your ear at times, to let their input be valuable, to never dishonor them. And by the way, this principle is, for all authority, not just in parents, but I think this speaks to parents. Just listen to this real fast. First Peter 2.18. It says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. So that honor is supposed to go to parents, whether they're believers or whether they're not. When it says obey your parents in the Lord, it doesn't mean just if they're saved. It means that this is God's will for you no matter what. If your parents are unbelievers, if they are atheists, if they hate God, if they are murderers, you know, maybe you're not supposed to obey commands to sin, but honor is to go to all parents, even if they are ungodly. And God can use that, by the way. Sometimes you say, well, he doesn't deserve my honor. He doesn't deserve for me to obey because he's, he's wayward in his life. Well, you know, God many times uses that honor to break the heart of someone and bring them around uh, to a place of repentance. And so never discount what, what that can do. But, but never discount what God will bring into your life if you dishonor your parents. Oh, forget that, cast it off. Now you open yourself up to uh, judgment of God in your life. And so jo- Jacob here... Um, just as, as a father that Joseph shows reverence to. Let's go on, look at verse 13, Genesis 48 and verse 13. It says, And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. So let's, we'll talk about the left and the right in just a second. But what is Joseph doing by bringing his kids near to Jacob. Remember, we just talked about this. Who is Joseph? Joseph is number two behind only Pharaoh. And yet, he, and and, and who is Jacob in the eyes of the Egyptians? He's just a shepherd. He's just, he's an abomination to them. And And Joseph, this Egyptian now, so to speak, the way that he lives in the world, he brings his children to be blessed, not by Pharaoh, but by Jacob. And it speaks to a couple of things. One, it speaks to the family. Uh, and I think, two, it speaks to the family of God. I think it speaks to the people of God. Here's Joseph. And I don't know if this, uh, by the way, it's been said that what he does here could have cut off his sons from future advancement in Egypt, that he snubbed his nose at them. He doesn't, he doesn't respect us. He's leaving and he's going, and this is what Moses did. He, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God that, that potentially Joseph could have been cutting off his two sons from certain advancements and certain potentials in the future so that they could identify, with, so he could say to them, this is who you really are. You're not one of them. You're not of the world. You're not part of Egypt. You're part of God's people. And he brings and he desires. He could have given blessings left and right, but he desired the blessings of God's people to be on his children. Uh, And I think, um, I really think that that is the greatest part of it, that he desires the the prophecy. I don't think he knows what's going to happen here. The prophecy is going to, that's, in fact, he disagrees with part of it at first, so I don't think he knows. But he just desires, uh, Dad's about to die, and I want him to give a blessing to my grandchildren before he dies. He desires that blessing from his, from his father. Look at verse 14. And let's go ahead and read all the way down through 22, and then we'll say a couple things about it before we finish. It says, And Israel 
stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Now he's blind, but somehow he perceives or knows how they're coming. Maybe it's like this. I can't tell who's who and I can't see, but I know that the way that Joseph's going to arrange them, he's going to send the, the oldest to my right hand, the son of my right hand, the blessing, to get the birthright. Uh, and he's going to send the younger to my left hand. And I know he's going to do that, and so he switches his hands in front of everybody and makes a scene. <laughs> um, I don't know how long this scene went on, uh, and I don't think it was uh, immature at all. But look at verse 15. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day. That's a great truth you can put in your pocket, by the way. God, have you ever starved to death? Anyone here ever starved to death and you died because you didn't have enough food? God is the one who has fed you all your life long to this day. It wasn't because you were really... Uh, smart and you thought ahead and you worked and you got you were smart enough that you got a good education so you could get a good job and provide. God provided for everything you have and he recognizes that. Uh, God uh, which fed me all my life long to this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And this, by the way, is right after he's bowed down before him. You know, uh, Here I bow before you. Oh, no, don't do that. Lift up. Yeah, it's just because you can't see. That's probably. Or, you know, the dementia is setting in. You know, we, we need to fix this. Uh, he picks up his hand, and they have a little bit of a tug-of-war contest, and Jacob, it turns out Jacob is stronger than Joseph on this day. He wins the, the I'm just kidding. Uh, they had an arm wrestling contest. So um, look at verse 18. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. So two things that Jacob is doing here. The first thing is that he is giving Joseph his birthright. He's giving Joseph the birthright above, it says there in that last verse, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren. So here's the way that they would do it back then. If there were five children, they would split up the inheritance into six parts. And the oldest gets two-sixths, and everyone else gets one-sixth, so that he would have a double portion. And that's what he does. He's not necessarily giving goods here, but the greatest thing that Jacob has to give is, is the inheritance in the land of Egypt and part and being a tribe in the, in the nation in the land of Israel. And so he says, I give you, Joseph, two tribes. A lot of times you hear the 12 tribes. Have you ever done this? You look at the 12 tribes and you're like, hey, I thought Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob. How come he got left out? Is it because, I mean, man, he just can't catch a break. He gets sold into slavery and then he gets left out of the inheritance. Um, he didn't get left out. He actually got in there twice with not his name, but Ephraim and Manasseh. They were the two representatives of Joseph. So Joseph got the birthright. By the way, it talks about this specifically. Look at 1 Chronicles 5. 1 Chronicles chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. It explains why this happened. <clears throat> and by the way, this issue will be, Jacob will go back to it, will hearken back to it in the next chapter, chapter 49. When he, returned, when he blesses all the sons, 
So 1 Chronicles 5, look at verse 1. It says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but forasmuch as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the, sons of Israel, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. So this is the day here in Genesis 48 when the birthright is given out. And Joseph gets it because Reuben disqualified himself from getting it. He didn't get the birthright or the, the other blessing. And it says that Judah, among all the children, remember and it says that he distinguished himself. He prevailed above his brethren. This is probably you know, just several times when they were going down to Egypt. And he says, let me bear the blame. I'll take responsibility for Benjamin. And so Judah became the spokesman. He became the family leader. And because of that, <clears throat> the Messiah comes through Judah's line. All the kings, David, Solomon, they all go through Judah. But the birthright was Joseph's because he was the most faithful, I, I believe, that uh, Jacob and that God recognizes. And so the youngest, almost the youngest, Joseph is number 11 out of 12. There was no way he should have ever gotten the birthright. And it wasn't just because he loved him more. I believe it was because God chose him. Uh, Jacob here is dealing prophecies. Everything that he says here is inspired of God. This, he's doing what God has told him to do. He wouldn't know anything about Ephraim and Manasseh except from God. And when he chooses Joseph to bless Ephraim and Manasseh, that's also from God. So, so Joseph gets the birthright. And the second thing that he does is that he goes ahead and he leapfrogs. And on the same day, he gives out the birthright for his children and for Joseph's children. By the way, Joseph... Uh, I'm going to save you the trouble of having to make a decision later. I'm going to go ahead and give the birthright to Ephraim. I'm going to give your birthright to Ephraim instead of Manasseh. And Joseph says, hey, I was going to give it to Manasseh. I had it all planned out. I had this plaque, had his name on there, it was engraved. Um, and so here's what this you know, speaks to us about a couple of things. That, we, by the way, we see God's will coming down through here in God's way. This has become par for the course in this family. Forget about the firstborn birthright. This has not happened once yet. Abraham was not the firstborn of his father. And yet God chose him to be the one to lead the nation, to, you know, to make the nation of Israel out of him. And then his son, who is his firstborn? Ishmael. Ishmael doesn't get chosen. It's Isaac that gets the birthright. And then Isaac's son, who is the firstborn? Esau. Esau gets rejected, and Jacob gets the birthright. And then Jacob's firstborn, Reuben, he's rejected, and Joseph gets the birthright. And then Joseph's sons, Manasseh is the firstborn. He's not chosen. It's every single time this has been God's will to turn human rationale on its head. And God loves to do this just to keep us guessing. Sometimes it kind of seems like that, doesn't it? Not just keeps guessing. God loves to do this to teach us a wonderful truth. And let's look at a verse in Isaiah 55. This will be the, one of the last places that we turn this morning. Isaiah 55, and look at verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> it says that God's ways are higher and better than our ways. So look at Isaiah 58, verse 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's not just that God's ways are higher, it's that they are so much higher, they're like the heavens and the heaven of heavens above the earth. There's, there's no contest between earth and heaven. Uh, that's how much higher and how much better God's ways are than our ways. And as humans, by the way, here's, here's the context. What's the context of that? Of that uh, in what context does God say that my ways are higher than your ways? Look at the verse right before it. Look at verse 7. It says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. You know what that means? Is that the way that Israel lived and the way that we as people naturally are is if somebody does that, he deserves that. Well, how about we show him mercy? Psst, 
No way. He did that to me. He gets no mercy. He needs to get what's coming to him. And God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My, my ways are much higher. Where you would hold a grudge and bitterness and just throw someone in the trash, I forgive. And by the way, what we, that, those three verses right there are our salvation. We go to heaven someday because God's ways are higher than man's ways. And we ought to be glad for it. Whenever you look down, I've heard people say something like this about, uh, do you believe that God will forgive people and let them go to heaven because of sin? Yeah, he can. How about Hitler? Oh, Hitler, you know, he's, he's no way. God would never, if he had died, if he had trusted God on his deathbed, God, he still would have gone to hell. Because God, you just, it was so awful what he did. And if we ever have that thought, we, we don't understand what we've done to God. And we don't deserve him. Uh, the angels in heaven surrounding the throne should be saying, God, what are you doing? Not just the devil. The devils are accused of brethren. But the other angels should be like, why do you let Daniel in? He's a moron, a loser. Look at all that he's done. There's no way he should be forgiven. And then God says, my ways are higher than man's ways. That's the only way we get to heaven. Not because you're good enough or you're better enough than anyone. We are the worst of the worst. And, but God is higher. So this, at every turn in our lives... There's our will. And by the way, on this day, Joseph is a great man of God, right? Not a lot of negative we could say about Joseph. He's honoring his father. He's bringing his sons. He wants his father's blessing on them. But he had a different idea in his mind about the future. And he had to allow God to correct his plans. And I believe he did. I believe that going forward, he allowed, I don't think he started treating one with favoritism, he loved them both. But when it came time, he acknowledged God's plan. And this happens in our own lives, this also happens with our kids. Here's what my son's going to, here's what my children are going to do. I'm going to arrange this, they're going to be here, go here, do that, and then I'm going to send them off in that direction. And sometimes God says, I'm not sending him in that direction, I'm sending him in this direction. And then we, like, Jake, like Joseph, reach over to God's hands and say, not so God, I've got a better plan. I already thought this through. This is what they need to do in order to survive in life. And God says, my ways are higher than your ways. And at every turn of life, you, sometimes it's going to be in disappointment. Sometimes God's plan will at first be a disappointment in your life. Sometimes it will be through a tragedy that God redirects you. By the way, if God ever brings a tragedy and redirects you from your own way to his way, it's the best thing that could ever happen in your life. Even though it's tragedy, and I don't ask, I don't hope for it on anyone, I don't pray for it in my life, but we need to acknowledge that if God will spare us from a life of heartache going our own way, even if he has to bring tragedy, it's the best possible thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, I've, I've heard of, uh, I've known some th families and I've seen some families where uh, maybe Christian family and they have children, and it's very difficult. They have children that are born with uh, great disabilities or what the, what the world would call disfigurement, uh, things like this. And at the, at, at the moment, maybe they're thinking something like, God, why would you allow this in my life? Why would you do this in my life and do this to them? And now they're going to they're gonna have to go through life with this and, and our family's going to struggle with this. And then they've seen over time that God gives them a heart for those kids. They never would go back. They wouldn't have changed a thing. They wouldn't have gone back later and said, God, could I switch them out for someone who the world thinks better of, they love, and God used that to teach them a lesson they would not have learned otherwise about unconditional love and about, you know, sacrifice and anything they can do to be a blessing to those children. And they look back and they thank God, even though at the, at the time they didn't understand it, they questioned, maybe they were even angry, but they look back and they said, this is the best possible thing. And any scenario of life, God can use this that his way is maybe different from your way, and he does it to teach you. He does it to grow you. Like, uh, you know, Job would not have asked for all that he went through, the deaths of all of his children and the loss of all of his stuff, but he says, when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. And God is trying to grow your faith. God is trying to, to grow us into the image of his son. Have you ever asked God about something like that in your life? Have you ever asked God, why did you do that? Why did you send me here? Why did you allow this to happen? He did it for a reason because his ways are higher. They're, they're not just different. They are better. You know, like, uh, anyway, uh, some, some people say uh, eating something with a fork instead of chopsticks. Why do we, you know, it's because it's just better, okay? It's not just that it's different from chopsticks. It's that it's better than chopsticks. I'm just kidding. Um, but God's way, here, and here's the last step. It's not just that God's ways are 
better than our ways, it's that God's ways are perfect. It's all the way to the top. You cannot improve. You cannot change God's ways and improve them in a second. In in your entire life, they are perfect. I want to finish by just giving God this glory by reading some verses. Mark chapter 7, verse 37. Jesus had done some miracles and the people saw this. It says, and they were beyond measure astonished, saying, he hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Can you stop and take inventory of your life? Just push pause right now. Look at it all and say, God has done all things well. We struggle with that sometimes. We say, well, God, you know, he's pretty good, but I would have done this differently and that differently. He's done it all just right. Genesis 131, he created everything. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was perfect. Psalm 18, verse 30 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Deuteronomy 32, 4 is similar. It says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. And so we recognize that everything that God does is perfect. I want to finish with this verse as it kind of brings it down. There's Sometimes there's looking at God's way and saying, okay, what he did was perfect, but what about me? What about the things that I would choose? Romans 12, 2 says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants you to change. He wants you, here's, here's especially as men, but women also, we need to acknowledge that we are bad. You need to go look in the mirror and say, me bad, you know, whatever it takes. We, we, need, a, we need a dose of humility. We need to say, what I think is probably, it's not that it might not be right, it's that it's probably not right. And God wants us to be transformed. He says, you're going you're to change in some way. You're going to be changed to be like the world. Don't be conformed to the image of the world. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind and my mind needs to change. We need to renew it and be, have it changed to be like his mind so that we can prove, so that our lives can bear out that his will is perfect. It says it's good and it's acceptable and it is perfect. If you do God's will, it may not make sense right now. Especially, you may, you may already have a lot invested in your direction. I talk about this scenario a lot. People go to college. I remember meeting people at college that three years in, God changed their major. They were going to graduate in one year. They didn't. They changed their major. They yielded to God, and they had to stick around for another two or three years. And and if they could have said, no, I already spent this much money. I've, I've got this much, this much is water under the bridge. I can't get that back, so I'm just going to stay the course with what I've already chosen. And they were willing to shift gears. They were willing to change. And today they're serving God in ministry, and they do not say, oh, I just wish I'd gone back to that other job. I wish I'd gone back to that other major. If you, if you do God's will, you will prove that it is perfect. And it might not start out seeming perfect. It might start off like, God just rolled a gutter ball with my life. What am I, what's God doing? This doesn't make sense. And then all of a sudden one day something can come into focus. Something, and now, now I, I see what God was doing. And I'm glad. And by the way, you may not understand it here, but in heaven, everyone's glad. Everyone that did God's will in heaven is glad that they ever did God's will. No one ever wishes. No one ever wishes. Moses doesn't wish. Oh, you know, if I could have gone back and stayed in the good graces, I could have been Pharaoh. Imagine what my life could have been. Moses doesn't care about that because he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And may we, as we're on earth, change our mind, go God's track for our lives, and never look back and never say, I wonder what could have been. That's a a fool's errand to wonder about what the past would have been if you had just not done God's will. God's will is perfect, and Joseph realized that on this day, and he yielded to it. I have a plan. It's for, Man- it's for Manasseh. And then God said, no, it's going to be Ephraim. And he says, no, Manasseh. And then God said, no, Ephraim. And then he realized this is God's will, and he submitted to it. Um, we need to learn how to say yes to God. Let's pray together this morning.
Lord, we thank you for the principles and the lessons we learn here from Genesis 48. We thank you for the cooperation that Jacob and Joseph have together. Uh, eventually, they got there, the cooperation with your will. We thank you that you always have a plan that is perfect, that it's our very best. Lord, maybe even this morning, there's someone who's struggling with your will. They're struggling with a decision. Maybe they're contemplating something that's out of your will. And, and they just think this is the way that it needs to be, that it has to be. Help us to know that your will is perfect. It may involve heartache at times. It may involve struggle and difficulties. It may involve humility and, and denying ourselves. But help us to know that it's always worth it because your way is perfect. And the, the greatest life we can ever live is a life under your blessing, is a life in your favor. <clears throat> This morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe God has spoken to your heart about something. I want to first just ask a couple of questions. How many of you here that would say, I know for sure. We talked about this morning kind of being in the family of God, identifying with the people of God. And we have to make a decision sometimes to walk away from the world so that we can identify with the people of God. The question I want to ask this morning is, are you one of the people of God? And by that, I mean not how were you born, who are your parents, by that I mean, has there been a time in your life that you've realized you were a child of the devil? Everyone's born a child of the devil. Everyone's born on their way to hell. Has there been a time that you realized you were a child of the devil and instead you turned and you believed in, you trusted Jesus and he made you a child of the king? He passed you from death unto life, from darkness to light. That happened, it doesn't happen in a progressive over time, it happens in a moment that someone believes the gospel and calls on the name of the Lord. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It only happens one time in your whole life. Do you know for sure that heaven's your home because there's been that time in your life? If that's your testimony, I know for sure that heaven's my home, that I'm, I'm forgiven of all my sins and I'm delivered. Would you hold your hand to the air? I know for sure that I'm a Christian. All right, you can put your hand down. Anyone that would say, I don't know that for sure. Maybe you think about it a lot and it plagues your mind, or maybe you've never really thought about it much. And, and maybe you've been working on it. Maybe you think you're, you're close. The Bible says you're either 100% forgiven or you're not forgiven. Anyone that would say, I don't know that for sure, but I'd like to know that in my life. Pray for me. I want to know for sure that I'm a Christian. All right, for those of us that are saved, maybe God has spoken to you through something in his word this morning. Maybe it, maybe it was about um, honoring the parents. Maybe God has spoken to you about your relationship with your children or with your parents. Maybe God's spoken to you about his will. Maybe like Joseph, you didn't understand something God wanted and you reached over to try to move God's hand. God, it needs to be like this. And maybe God just has spoken to your heart this morning to say you need to let go and choose my will and acknowledge that my will is perfect. I will never let you down. Maybe God has spoken to your heart. Let's go ahead and stand to it as, a, as music softly plays. And if you'd like to come and kneel at the altar and maybe just give yourself to God. Say, God, I want your will for my life. Uh, I'm on a path that I, it's, if I stay on this path that's headed toward destruction, maybe God needs to humble you more. Maybe God needs to change your mind. Maybe you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Whatever God's spoken to you about, we'll have time when we can do business with God. This is not between you and somebody else here this morning. It's just you and God. He sees your heart. But don't leave here this morning with God seeing your heart unchanged, with God seeing your heart stubborn. Uh, yield to Him, and then we'll close together in prayer.
we don't always understand what you're doing. <clears throat> Help us to trust that you see the end from the beginning and we are very short-sighted and finite. We don't always understand what you're doing, but help us to believe that you've done all things well, that your way is perfect. Help us to learn to say no to self and yes to you. You must increase and we must decrease. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.